my guest this evening is familiar to many of you. He is a well-known drummer, musician, and songwriter. He is also the author of The Touring Vegan. Please welcome to the Eclectic Arts Virtual Studio, John Siren. John. Hey there. How's it going? I'm doing very well, sir. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Just, uh, you know, we did a little bit of a sound check and ate a little bit of dinner. So and now we're here. So nice and relaxed before the the events all begin. Nice, nice. And for um, I know there's a lot of fans that uh, go way back with Mankind is Obsolete and a lot of other things that you've been a part of. Um, I'm more of a newer fan, quite honestly. So um, some of the folks out there, please give me some some grace. <laughs> if you're asking one of like, why is Mark asking those questions that I already know answers to? Hey, I'm trying to find out information myself. So um, but I, I definitely want to go all the way back to the beginning in terms of your drum background and your musician background. Um, being a musician myself, I love hearing that kind of thing. So um, did you start with the drums? Did you start with a different instrument? What, what kind of got you on the path as a musician? Um, I always wanted to play the drums. Uh, my parents were reluctant to, to have that be a thing because they're so loud when I was a kid. So uh, they did, though, get me a, a guitar and I moved over to bass kind of quickly because I saw like a need for bass players even as a, as a young kid. So I, I started off with guitar and bass. And if we even go way far back when I was in preschool, I took like a year of piano, but I it was terrible and I absolutely hated it. So um, I don't hate the piano now, but uh, so yeah, if we wanted to like take it like super far back, that's, you know, I started off on piano, but anyway, drums came about eventually uh, more in like around high school. And uh, I wasn't super focused to be perfectly honest. I, I didn't really practice much. You know, I played in a few bands uh, and I would only practice when I was with those bands and we weren't like amazing players or anything like that. It wasn't until I was 18 that I started to really take it seriously. So. Okay. And yeah. uh, were you, are you self-taught? Are you taking lessons or both? I've taken lessons on and off over the years. I'll even take lessons now. Um, occasionally there's a couple of teachers in the LA area that are really specialized in certain aspects of drumming. So I'll go to, to them on occasion. Um, one of them is Rob Carson. He's known for technique, uh, snare drum technique and, and finger and hand technique. So I, I work with him uh, occasionally and I've worked with Dave Elich as well too. Um, so he's kind of known for drumming with Mars Volta. And he's drummed with uh, like Miley Cyrus and a few other pop acts, I believe. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's interesting and also something that's always good for um, um, newer musicians to understand is that you, you never stop learning. And um, I think I think back to that story when uh, when the professor was still with us, uh, Neil Peart, uh, he was trying to learn from some jazz musicians well into his career because he he was fascinated by it and he wanted to add new techniques to his his drumming. And it's like you can never stop. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's legendary drummers like when I worked at a restaurant. Uh, um, for a long time, Virgil Donati, who's a really famous drummer for, you know, his technical prowess, you know, he, he was even telling me about Rob Carson that he takes lessons from this guy even now. So, I mean, like, mm -hmm. it, it just goes to show it's like, you can always continue to learn. You can always, uh, you know, I, I think it's even good, even if you're at an advanced level to take, take lessons once in a while, if you're real serious about it, because it can only help, um, you know, unlock some some doors or get you through some plateaus. Yeah, no, I, I, abs I absolutely agree. And, um, and uh, so when you mentioned that uh, you started with guitar, you moved to bass because you saw that there was a need for, for bass. I was kind of in a similar position in high school because I had a bass, even though I played guitar and not yeah. the guys that I was jammed with. It's like, well, Mark, you got a bass. Why don't you be our bass player? It's like, well, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then I didn't realize I got to college how much there was a huge need for bass players. Um, oh yeah. There's either like a ton of guitarists, um, you know, some drummers, uh, a lot of vocalists that I found. Well, and some of them are kind of, <laughs> but uh, you know, bass wise, there's like we need you here, 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 and here. It's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Um, so how how are you finding things? Uh, and we were kind of talking about this pre-show. If we could jump all the way to to the present um, during this time, where artists 
of all types, entertainers, you know, things were kind of put on hold and they had to kind of figure out other ways. I know you mentioned that you've been doing some virtual lessons, speaking of lessons. So how you've been kind of um, coping during this time? Yeah, I mean, at first it was really challenging. Uh, you know, I lost pretty much all the tours I was supposed to do for the year. I was, I was getting ready to leave the following day and then they shut down all the venues. So, I mean, even up to the last moment with, I was supposed to go out with um, Tim Scold. I, I had been drumming with him a bunch and uh, we were, we had just done a tour, but we were going to do an American tour with uh, Carnifex, Three Teeth and the Browning. Mm -hmm. And that all got canceled. And then the frontline assembly stuff all got canceled as well too. We were supposed to go out with ministry and KMFDM and do a bunch of Euro dates as well. Um, so anyway, you know, at first it just hit me really hard and we didn't really even know what was going to happen with, with the virus. I mean, people were afraid to even go to the grocery store. So I did probably, I mean, I didn't completely, I guess I, I wasn't like paralyzed from it necessarily. I mean, I just was like, all right, well, let's make some lemonade out of the situation. And so I, I just started practicing immediately. I filed for unemployment. Um, that took a while. I wasn't even sure if I was going to get it or not. Um, and I fought, filed for a couple um, music grants that were out there. People sent me links where they were. And actually, Music Cares, that was an organization that was giving money to musicians that lost work. They actually um, sent me a check, which was really cool. I mean, I never thought something like that would have happened. So that was really nice and it was very helpful. Uh, and then during the process, besides just practicing and kind of seeing where this was going, it, it was kind of evident to me that nothing was going to happen this year at a certain point. And so I, um, with the help of my friend, developed a website and started trying to advertise that, you know, I'm going to teach uh, drum lessons. And also um, I can record for bands and things like that because right when the pandemic started too i got hit up um by a friend's band to to record so that was nice so i i, I got a couple of paying gigs right up right off the bat you know when when everything changed um so yeah and so here we are now i'm teaching drum lessons and i'm also personal training that was something i sort of fell into um but i'm doing that as well so that's a lot of fun so yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, you know that that sounds great, and it's awesome to hear things where like an organization like Music Cares, you know, um, sent you a check and it's you know doing what they can to try to help out. And um, I, I know we were also talking pre-show about uh, when you're teaching lessons virtually, how how different that is. It's also been a while since you've uh, been teaching lessons. So um, when you've been working with your students, what kind of are you getting students that are pretty much new, or are they already established and they want to get better? What kind of students um, have you been working with? Um, I've got five students right now and let's see, three of them are new and then the other two have had some experience in the past. So we're, we're, we're on to more advanced, um, topics, but, so, but it's also, cool. I like teaching people from the ground up too, because there's just so many angles you can, you know, kind of begin with. So I try to figure out what their interests are, uh, you know, what their goals are and, and then we start moving in that direction. Um, and it's cool because then you can focus on all the little details of, of getting them to where they, they want to eventually be. And you see like, you know, the growth spurts that happen with beginner students is, you know, that can be pretty incredible. So that's, it's kind of fun to watch and be a part of. Yeah, no, I, I can relate to that. There was a short period of time many years ago when I was teaching guitar lessons and having a student that was brand spanking new to it who didn't know how to even like, you know, fret a chord or something. And depending on how dedicated they were, how much they, you know, really bought into what we were doing, man, uh, watching them go, you could have one student, you know, this from who's been working on it for say a month and they've gone so far up and then the same, a different student for a month. And they're maybe only like here because they just haven't been practicing. They're just not that into it as much. Um, and it's, it, you just never know depending on the teacher and the student and how you do your business and what's going to click. I know for myself, when I start um, playing first couple months, I didn't like, I have small hands and I didn't, I was kind of not forced into guitar <laughs> lessons, but it was kind of like, well, we got you a guitar for as a present for Christmas. So now you're going to take lessons, but then something clicked about maybe six months into it. And then you couldn't get it out of my hands. 
um, is just play, 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 play and practice. And I couldn't, you could, I was like a sponge, give me more, give me more. And um, it's, that's, that's awesome to be around that when you're the teacher. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's really cool. And you have to find different ways depending on the student, you, you know, so you have to be very creative and, and shift, shift your approach depending on, you know, how the student learns. And that's one thing that I've kind of figured out. You can't, you can't just uh, give sort of a, you know, I guess like a, an itinerary that works for everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of see the the detail and everything that, you know, you have to kind of look at with, you know, depending on the student. Yeah, no, that, that that's very, very true. You, you can't just say, here's the textbook of how we're going to do this. And if it doesn't work for you too bad, it's like, no, you got to figure out many different ways um, to, to reach that student so that they, um, you know, really start reaching, like you were saying, try to start reaching their goals or what they want to do. Um, you've, you've drummed for so many different bands, you know, either permanently as a live touring drummer, session drummer. I mean, you, your, your laundry list is really, it's super, super long. And um, so over the years of you drumming, have you found that, is it um, like how you go about your business? So you start getting referred to other people meeting people on, on different tours so that it turns out they need a drummer to fill in at some point. How does this kind of work? Because you've been working a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's always been my life goal ever since I was a child to be a professional musician and to be someone who tours. And, you know, I saw MTV a lot as a kid, you know, I mean, I was, I was, I had that imprinted on my mind and, and then I got very much into underground music and so forth. So, um, Although I like all sorts of music, especially the older I get to, it's just, you know, anyway, um, getting back on track. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry. What was the question again? <laughs> sorry. I was, I was, I was going down a different path in my mind now and, uh, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, no, not a problem at all. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's more like, um, since you've been, um, you have been working so much over the years, over the decades, really, Right. Um, that's, maybe I should rephrase this. It's more like, how have you been able to connect, get these gigs, work with all these different bands? So maybe if there's somebody else coming up, what advice would you give them? What can they do so they can kind of be in the same, the same boat that you're in? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happened for me originally, which got the ball rolling is, um, I had my own band, you know, I was doing Mankind is Obsolete back in, you know, when I was going to MI, which was a music school. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where that all began. And from there I had met other groups, um, and we had done shows and whatnot. And then occasionally would there be a situation? Like I remember dismantled was a band, an industrial band early on that I had done a gig with. And, uh, when they could no longer have the drummer that they had, um, Gary hit me up. And so li literally just one thing led to the next. So all of a sudden I started morphing into this kind of hired gun type of guy, which wasn't really the path that I was intending on going towards. I actually always considered myself more of a songwriter for the longest time and less of a drum, like drums were incidental. I was, I, I never thought that I was technically amazing or, or, you know, I, I was able to kind of just get the job done, but I, 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 or at least, you know, I felt like I didn't have anything particularly special about the way that I played. It was just more like I understood how to like, you know, achieve the goal of the song um, versus like, I don't know, have all sorts of flair and, and what have you. Um, anyway, that being said, yeah, I mean, I, I joined Dismantled and then from there it just kept on branching itself further. You know, I started playing with like Kidney Thieves and then I don't know. The sequence is, is confusing at this point. You know, there's Cyclone 9, there's Information Society, there's Frontline Assembly, you know, IMX. It's, it, I mean, and then a bunch of other bands in between as well, too. God Module, System Sin, Imperative Reaction, mainly industrial type of bands, but also some metal bands. Like I was playing with Paul from Cradle of Filth with his band uh, for a tour. And then, you know, sometimes people will just hire me for a tour, like, the drummer for Pop Will Eat Itself couldn't do a tour. So I just jumped in, you know, like I got recommended, especially if you, you know, you're already at a point where people can see that you're like a decent person, you know, whatever, you know, you'll show up to the gig, you'll be prepared. They don't have to like do much uh, guiding you of how to 
play their songs, um, I think that, that you'll start to get a lot more work. So what I would suggest, I guess bringing it all back, what I would suggest to young artists who would like to pursue uh, something similar is, first of all, you just have to be seen. So get out there with any band, whatever it is. It, it could be your band or someone hire, you know, just brings you on like, you know, your buddies in the garage and they're going to play a show. Just get out there and start playing the show first because you have to be seen. And then from, you know, and then network, you know, talk to people, you know, if you find bands that you like, talk to them and, you know, stay in touch. And then you never know. I mean, it's such a, um, an ever changing industry and business. It's like even gigs that I've had for a long time, you know, some other drummer might have to come in because I've already committed to something else, you know? So even with a lot of the bands I've mentioned, there's some of them where, you know, I've had to sub that out or, or for instance, you know, with like frontline assembly or something like that, like, you know, I was, I, you know, I started off as being like a person that was subbing out, you know, with that band. And then all of a sudden I think that they needed me, on a, on a more consistent basis. So, yeah. That's, well, no, that's awesome. And I, I think um, the, the advice is also sound, especially about um, being seen. Um, some people, uh, you know, you can only stay in your bedroom for so long or your basement. Um, like, <laughs> you got to get out there and, and let people see what you do. And then, and everybody knows you're going to get better and better to keep, that you keep working on things and as you perform and perfect your craft. Um, and also like you mentioned too, about uh um, networking, you know, it's so big. And if you're on a band, you know, on a bill with five bands, you know, stick around and, and check out the other bands and talk to some of the other musicians and, and kind of see what's going on because you're, especially if it's local, because you're going to run into them again somewhere if you're playing similar music, um, just like with photographers. And I know the most of the local photographers around here because we're in the same photo pits together. So right. um, it, it only makes sense to say, Hey, what's, you know, what's up, what's going on? How are you? Um, and, uh, and I'm just curious now having, even though you mentioned that still, you, you, consider yourself a songwriter and then the drumming thing was kind of incidental and just kind of took off in its own you know organic way um how do you feel your drumming's changed from the early days to now well i'm a lot more diverse i'll say that because of the styles that i've ended up you know playing in um which i really enjoy because honestly i i love all sorts of music and i think even you know when if you were to listen you know if people listen to like mankind is obsolete for instance they can you know, if you dig kind of deep into the catalog, I mean, it's, it's pretty eclectic over the years. And I think we even started it off with that being a mission statement of, all right, well, people are going to recognize Natasha's vocal style. They'll recognize certain elements of it, but we're not going to put ourselves into a box of what it's going to, you know, we're not trying to make this neat box necessarily that will, you know, that could be marketed really well. Uh, I don't think that was ever our goal because we wanted the freedom to be able to expand and, um, and, and also to tap into to a lot of the different influences that we all have, you know, you know, none of us were in like just into one particular style or something like that. So I think that is something that's something cool about playing with so many groups and like, and uh, you know, especially, you know, going from like, you know, the band that, I just recorded something with they're a black metal band called Ancestral Awakening and then going into Information Society, which is like an 80s pop band. Um, I mean, it's totally it's just totally different. <laughs> so, I mean, my 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 ability to kind of adapt to those situations has, has definitely uh, developed over the years. And I really like that because I, I, I find myself to be a bit um, all over the place when it comes to you know, what I want to listen to and when, I mean, half the time when I'm listening to um, Spotify or something like that, I have it on shuffle. So literally there could be a Cannibal Corpse song going into, I don't know, a Millie Vanilli song or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like, I, but I really do actually have a Millie Vanilli song on there. Cause I, you know, like, but uh, you know, people are like, no, no. All right. But, <laughs> um, I just try to think of the weirdest, you know, kind of difference there. But uh, no, I mean, literally my tastes are all over the map. So I like, I like a lot of different stuff. And people would be surprised at what's in my, my playlist. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's awesome. I, I know I have that in common. I think actually a lot of the, the Alice fans have that in common too. We listen to all, all sorts of different things. And I got this weird little six degree of separation when, when you mentioned Millie Vanilli because uh, one of my guests uh, in the summer uh, runs a guinea pig rescue. And oh, wow, she, cool. She was one of the gals that was in the Blame It on the Rain video for, me, for nice. Millie Vanilli. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have uh, Blame It on the Rain and Girl, You Know It's True in my in my shuffle. You know what it is? I heard those songs as a kid, and even if I didn't enjoy them as a kid, I think there's something nostalgic about that time period. And so there's a lot of songs that happened in like the 80s that I, I just like to hear. And even if I wasn't um, buying the albums back in the day or something like that, so... Anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's really cool that she was in that video. <laughs> yeah, I remember after the interview that night, I went back onto YouTube and, and looked for it and watched it. I was like, oh, yeah, that, there she is. Wow, that that's was... hilarious. So she's like, what, the love interest in the video? <laughs> yeah, there's there's like two girls, obviously, for one, you know, Rob and Fab, and she's the blonde. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a look myself. You know, I'm going to watch that later. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, so let's let's kind of shift gears a bit. I want to talk about the touring vegan. and. Okay. Uh, so where did this idea come from? How long have you been vegan? What can you tell me? All right. So I've been vegan since 1994, but there was, um, there was a, a period of time in the early 2000s where I was, um, there wasn't as much medical information. And I, I think I was sort of scared into like consuming some animal products for vitamin B12. So there was a moment where I was pescatarian, uh, like kind of in the early 2000s for, for maybe a year or something like that. Um, and, and then I didn't notice any different. And then I even started getting like blood tests later on being vegan and, and checking my levels and everything was fine. So, um, so what, got, what got me started doing the book, um, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent there, uh, was okay, I would a lot of times be on tour with bands that weren't vegan and a lot of times uh, promoters and whatnot, if they were, if there was any sort of hospitality, it was definitely not vegan friendly. So I, I always had to figure out ways of taking care of myself and, you know, uh, making sure that I'm eating healthy on the road, which is really tough, especially when you don't have a kitchen to cook in and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and a lot of times people would ask me, like, how do you tour as a vegan? And how, how do you go to some of these countries like Russia and do that? And I, and then, so, so I, you know, that was sort of an inspiration right there. Like hearing, hearing people ask me this all the time. So I was like, all right, you know what, I'm going to write a book. And so I started in the middle of like a giant tour sequence with IMX. I was, I, I had like a two year tour plan with them. Um, and I wasn't working a normal job or anything like that at the time either. So I, I so in between uh, tours, I had a bit of free time, which was a luxury because I, I never usually had that. Um, so I started writing the book and, and uh, the rest is history, you know. So I kind of explain what inspired me to go vegan. Then I explain how I do it on the road. So I make it, I make it more interesting. I kind of give a little bit of a story as to, you know, you know, kind of like what brought me here and then like all the different, you know, tips, you know, that I can offer to those who travel, not even if you're just in a band, but someone who travels a lot. And I realized that I wrote this book back in 2017 and like, there's been a massive leap just globally with uh, you know, people eating plant-based or vegan. So it's just a lot more accessible than it was back in the nineties, especially. But, um, I guess the way that I eat is very specific too, even amongst vegans, because I'm very much into the, what is considered the whole food plant-based diet, uh, where I try not to eat a lot of fragmented foods or refined products. So, you know, instead of eating white rice, I'm eating brown rice instead of white pasta or something like that. I mean, I'm having whole wheat pasta. I mean, that, that would be a quick and easy example of that. And I try to keep my oil to a minimum or, you know, I don't eat a lot of oil in my diet because of uh, heart disease in the family and that sort of thing. So I try to keep the fat content low as well, uh, based on like the findings of Dean Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn, who've done 
some cardiac research on, you know, kind of low fat, whole food, plant-based diets and, and reversing heart disease. So I'm trying to avoid heart disease as well. In addition to not consuming animals for ethical reasons. Okay. All right. I'm wondering, um, do you have a, an audio version of the book out? I did not. I actually, you know what, that would be a pretty good idea. Cause I mean, I do listen to a lot of audio books and I know a lot of people do as well. And it's sometimes an easier way to consume something. So maybe I might do that, especially since, you know, I have the recording software, I could probably just do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah because I, I was thinking that, you know, with podcasts being so popular and people loving just to listen to someone talk about something that, that uh, resurgence in audiobooks or, or even on a podcast, it just makes sense to uh, possibly, you know, go down that avenue as well to get more people out there to um, know about the touring vegan book that you, that you've written. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great idea. I mean, people asked about that early on. I mean, I, originally I had it in ebook format just because I was trying to have an environmental angle to it. I didn't want to use paper if I didn't need to, but there was, there was such a demand for the paper thing that I, you know, went through Amazon. So it was sort of one of those things where it's like, if you really want a paper copy, you can get it through Amazon. But uh, I tried for the first year that it was out, it was only available on ebook. But I don't think as many people read ebooks, or at least uh, people that would pick up the book because maybe they enjoy the music that I'm a part of. I think that they want the physical copy because then you can, you know, you can sign it to a show or, you know, I, there, there was definitely more of a demand. And I noticed that I sold a lot more paper copies than I did um, uh, ebooks. So. Yeah, and, and that would make sense. I think also the, with the background and the fan base that uh, knows your work. Um, we like tangible things and you know, if it's vinyl CDs, what have you, if it's you know, an actual paper book. Um, so that, that, that would make sense to me for sure. Um, yeah. we've got, we've got like roughly one minute here. Um, okay. so what I wanted to, I guess the last thing I wanted to ask was that, um, so for those that aren't vegan in a minute, which is <laughs> not a lot of time, what would you suggest to them? How, what's the best way to get started? Okay. I think the best way to get started, uh, two things I would find a vegan recipe or two for like every meal of the day that you really enjoy, like find something that you really like for breakfast, find something that you would like to, to eat for lunch, dinner, and then start there. Um, if that's even too much, I'd say the second thing to do is just simply incorporate more plants into your diet, you know, find ways to, to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables and see how your body feels. Um, and then, I will add to that too. Um, what helps to stay on track with like veganism for like ethical reasons is just to have like a mission statement. Like I'm doing this to like minimize suffering of animals. I'm doing this to, to help the environment um, so that there's less greenhouse gases. Um, you know, if you have sort of this mission statement going on in your mind, then I think it's a little bit easier to stay on course. Okay. That sound advice. Uh, John, thank you so much for taking the time. I really enjoyed uh, talking with Ashley. I could talk with you a lot longer. <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, yes. Yeah, it went by quick. <laughs> it, it did. And I'm so looking forward to uh, your set tonight. Uh, well, later tonight um, um, here on, on the virtual tour. So um, thank you very much for taking the time. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.